Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Professor Randall Ray, a senior scholar at the Levy Institute and author of the macroeconomics textbook co-authored with uh, uh, Professor Bill Mitchell and Martin Watts and a prominent post-Keynesian modern monetary theorist scholar and student of the famous Hyman P. Minsky. Uh, thank you for coming on. Sure, thanks for uh, having me on. Um, so in today's episode, um, we'll be looking at crisis, economic crisis, uh, specifically financial crisis. And it's a broad topic that includes a variety of issues such as investment, the accelerator growth, banking, and a range of policy instruments like monetary policy and regulation. And hopefully we'll be able to cover most of, if not all of these topics in the upcoming slides that the professor is going to uh, show us. So let's get right into it. Okay, so I'm going to um, go through the theoretical background and um, I'm happy to take questions on any of this and then we can discuss more uh, um, the financial crisis if you want. So uh, let's begin with Keynes. Uh, Keynes's general theory uh, really was the beginning of a non-Marxist macroeconomics. He's sort of the, the father of macroeconomics um, <clears throat> outside the Marxist tradition. And in his general theory, what he did was advanced a theory of effective demand. And in terms of the general theory, uh, what he uh, presents that as is the intersection of an aggregate demand curve he called D, the D curve and an aggregate supply curve he called the Z curve that determines the point of equilibrium, the point of effective demand. And the way that I always put this uh, to make it as simple as possible, uh, Keynes's view was that firms produce what they expect to sell. They hire the number of uh, workers that they believe are necessary to produce the amount of output they think they can sell uh, and make a profit. So that is the point of equilibrium. There's no reason to believe this is full employment because firms are not in the business of hiring and doing charity work. They're in the business of making profits, okay? In Keynes's system, investment is seen as the driving variable uh, that uh, causes income to increase or decrease and that saving simply adjusts to this. So Keynes, like the neoclassical approach before him, uh, agrees that investment equals saving in equilibrium, which is also in neoclassical theory. They do it in the loanable funds market. For Keynes though, uh, the saving depends on income and investment is the driver of income. So essentially saving just passively adjusts to be equal to investment. Okay, so it's seen as a demand driven model with investment, the driver of demand. And uh, this is fine for the short run, uh, which was Keynes's main concern in the general theory. So we look at the demand generating effect of investment, perfectly fine for the short run. But what does the short run mean? It means you can take the quantity of capital and the quantity of labor as fixed, and then you determine the point of equilibrium. So capacity is, is fixed and you try to, if you're not at full employment, then you might want to stimulate investment in order to increase aggregate demand and increase employment. So you try to figure out ways to increase aggregate demand so you can move toward full employment because the general assumption is that the market doesn't get you to full employment. You are generally below full employment and Keynes goes through a long explanation for why this should be your expectation in a capitalist economy. And I'm not gonna go through that in detail uh, now, but uh, the, the key is because we're a money using economy. Right. And it would be a sheer coincidence that employment would be at the, the full employment level. Yeah, we have we have a video on that on, on YouTube from the last okay. time you did come on, so we got that covered. But uh, the point I want to make is that Keynes talks about an equilibrium beneath full employment. But I think a lot of 
post Keynesians, especially like Steve Keen, I, I would think would have an issue with that since they don't really believe in equilibrium, right? Whether yes. underemployment or unfull employment, the, the economy is always out of equilibrium, a dynamic system. So what would your take be on that? Well, there, there are several different uh, post-Keynesian approaches and heterodox approaches in general. Uh, I accept the view that what Keynes was trying to do was to find a point of equilibrium that is not a market clearing equilibrium in any sense. It is a position of rest, as Joan Robinson put it. It's a position in which uh, firms have employed exactly the number of workers they think they need to produce the amount of output they can sell at profit. That's a state of rest. That is his definition of equilibrium. And I don't think that people like Steve Keen and so on fully understand this, that that is what Keynes means by equilibrium. It has nothing to do with market clearing. Right. Okay. So that's, that's my response. They may not be satisfied with this because they've probably heard it before. But I think this is Keynes's view, and this is certainly my view, and I think also the view of Joan Robinson. Okay, so anyway, uh, now we all know, because you, you had principles of economics, that there's a multiplier. So if investment goes up by 10, income goes up by more. And the reason is because as investment increases, what that means is you're employing more workers to produce capital goods, and those workers are going to consume. So consumption goes up too. So investment has a multiplier effect on income because the workers in the investment sector increase their consumption. And so income goes up by multiple. And for undergraduates, we usually use a multiplier of 10 because they can do the math. So if investment goes up by 10, income goes up by 100. Now, real world multipliers are nothing like this. Uh, maybe more like less than two. And uh, Keynes warns in the general theory, don't take this too literally. Don't get all hung up in the mathematics of this. He was very worried that people would have a very mechanical approach to the multiplier. And all the textbooks do have a mechanical approach to the multiplier. Okay. Uh, and he goes through reasons why the multiplier can vary uh, and so on that I'm not going to go through. But anyway, this then led to two issues in the early post-war period. Uh, the first is called the accelerator, and the second is uh, what leads to growth theory. Okay, because uh, in the general theory, we're taking a short-run approach, but if we expand this to a longer-run approach, it's not legitimate to hold capacity constant. If you're increasing investment, capacity goes up. You can produce more. So <clears throat> an increase of uh, uh, investment will increase income through the multiplier. And it's reasonable to assume that, that as you go through time, if national income is going up, firms want to invest more. So that is going to lead to an increase of investment. <clears throat> so this is called the accelerator because the multiplier process increases income, and then that induces more investment, which causes growth to accelerate. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then the one that I think is actually more interesting is that investment is going to lead to more capital that increases potential output. And that led to the question, how can you be sure that aggregate demand increases on a pace with potential output as investment uh, proceeds. And then this led on to growth theory. So those are the two topics I'm going to uh, go through. Uh, some Marxist economists like Paul Sweezy have this concept of the tendency of the surplus to rise, yeah. where especially with large oligopolistic firms that have a lot of spare capacity if the investments are made, but demand doesn't quite catch up to fill that. And that kind of leads to wastage and, and other kind of inefficient uses. And that kind of leads to crisis. Um, do you think there's any uh, truth to that kind of approach? Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a tendency towards secular stagnation 
Yes. Right. And I think that that is what we have seen in the post-war period. And so one way to try to forestall the stagnation is to have government increase spending. Now, none of the Keynes's own model and these models I'm going to uh, get into <laughs> don't directly include uh, government spending or even uh, the foreign sector. So we're doing a very simple, simplified model here. I'm going to go through the um, the work that showed the conditions in which aggregate demand does grow fast enough to use the capacity that's being generated without using the government to fill the demand gap. Okay, so it's possible, but it turns out unlikely. <laughs> uh, and so it's more likely you're going to end up with secular stagnation. And that is why there's a role for the government to play uh, or exports. But of course, uh, exports are beggar thy neighbor. Can't work for everybody. Uh, someone has to lose. And Keynes was very worried about that. So, yes, uh, that, that's exactly right. And so, yes, the, the, um, the work of Domar is similar to the work of Sweezy. Right. Right. But okay. So the Harrod Domar model, <clears throat> when I had a brief look, I haven't studied it in depth. They seem to have a loanable funds approach with more savings leads to more investment. No, not really. Nope. It's uh, what I look I, like I, in the textbook exposition. <laughs> it could be the textbook. Right, it, that, so. is, that is not the original Domar. Right. Uh, Domar had a very good understanding of Keynes and of okay. the saving investment relation. Uh, so I'll do that next. First, we'll do the accelerator, then I'll do the, um, okay. the so-called growth theory. Okay. So going back to Keynes, fluctuation in, of investment is the key driver of the cycle. And uh, that we're going to see it's also a key driver of profits. That's Koleski. So the accelerator model, we typically assume investment is autonomous. Uh, it has a um, multiplier effect. So basically that's what uh, Keynes is doing in the general theory. But now we're going to assume that desired investment is related to GDP. So as GDP rises, so it's not autonomous now, we're making it a function of income. Desire Your desired capital stock, K star rises, and we're gonna keep it simple uh, so that um, your desired capital stock is equal to V times expected uh, future uh, GDP, where V is your desired uh, capital income ratio. We're assuming firms have a desired capital ratio relative to income, and they're going to try to keep that ratio constant through time. It's a simplifying assumption that makes it possible to solve the model. Okay, So investment uh, in uh, time t has to close the gap to achieve the desired capital ratio. So V is the accelerator coefficient. It tells us how much investment is induced as income goes up. This is going to make investment more variable than GDP. We have a table in the textbook that shows you that uh, uh, it becomes much more, uh, the system becomes much more um, uh, unstable when we do this. And the reason in words is because investment has a multiplier impact on GDP, which then has an accelerator impact on investment as firms try to close the gap between investment and desired uh, investment based on that capital output ratio. Now, this is too simple. In the textbook, we go through a more a flexible accelerator. I'm not going to do that now. But uh, you could assume that firms just gradually close the gap instead of trying to close it really quickly. That helps to smooth things out and makes it uh, less unstable. I suppose the flexible one just kind of adds a speed of adjustment variable. Yes. And then if you're neoclassical, you can make that a function of the interest rate, which I, we didn't do in the textbook. Yeah. Okay, so there's an interaction of the multiplier and accelerator. Investment raises income through the multiplier. That increases investment through the accelerator. <clears throat> but as the economy uh, reaches a peak, 
and investment falls, that reduces income through the multiplier, reducing investment through the accelerator. So you can see that there's a feedback effect and it's gonna make the system very unstable. And um, the uh, cyclical behavior can be a nice stable cycle. It can be damped, which means you uh, reduce the deviation or explosive where you go to infinity or zero. Uh, depending on the parameters, which are the <laughs> propensity to save and the accelerator um, coefficient. Okay. Uh, okay I'm going to come back to this because yeah. Minsky starts here in the 1950s. Go ahead. All right. So maybe I'm considering over to wait for Minsky, but um, I guess I'll just say it now. Uh, so when I looked at this in the textbook and it, it kind of shows a cyclical pattern, like I think it goes right back to my notion about is there an equilibrium because we seem to constantly be in flux merely by the mechanisms of the multiply accelerator itself. Mm -hmm. And also, I know a lot of post-Keynesian theories and then Minsky's theory itself, uh, a lot of them are based on like psychological factors, like expectations about the future, are they, are they correct, are they wrong? Um, the multiply accelerator model seems to show cyclical fluctuations, even when you keep all the behavior mm -hmm. variables constant, like the propensity you consume and, and the responsiveness to investment um, in regards to changes in income. Um, so from the looks of it, capitalism mm -hmm. as a mere point of mathematics is unstable, right? Like behavioral factors kept constant. Yes, a a as we'll see. Uh, Minsky's argument is uh, the market processes are destabilizing. And this is an example of a market process that is destabilizing. But we can constrain the instability with right. institutions. So this puts orthodox economics, turns it on its head. In orthodox economics, the market is stable. The institutions destabilize it. Minsky reverses that. Right. Which is interesting because Samuelson kind of came up with this theory and he's a neoclassical equilibrium theorist. Like, how did he reconcile those two beliefs he had? I'll show you in just a minute. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's get to it. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, the second thing that I wanted to, to look at is related, but um, it's a bit different agenda. And that is the Domar Herod models, which became growth models. Now they did not think they were doing growth models. That isn't what they set out to do, um, but it's what became the growth model. So in the late uh, 40s and into the 50s, uh, people were worried that the Great Depression would come back, right? We had the, the huge boost of World War II, got us out of the Great Depression. Uh, Hansen, uh, warned that uh, you know we were going to have stagnation uh, with the withdrawal of all the government spending. Domar uh, was thinking about this question. Keynes is a short-run model, and he's ignoring the capacity effect of investment. How can we be sure that the demand effect of investment will be great enough to keep capital fully employed? What happens if it leads to excess capacity? Then we're going to get secular stagnation. Okay. <clears throat> and so Herod and Domar can be seen as trying to extend Keynes to allow capacity to change, which means now we're, we're doing a long-run model. So we're, we're moving from a short-run model to a long-run model. They also were interested in the distribution effects of different spending propensities. This is especially Herod. And... Uh, that is what led to post-Keynesian work on distribution. The early post-Keynesian work, Kregel and Eichner go through, and Passanetti, uh, through the distribution uh, impacts of changing the propensities to consume and save of workers and of capitalists. Again, I'm not going to go into that. That's not the direction that interested me uh, of the, the Domar model. Uh, what interested me was this question about stability through time, okay? So a general growth model <clears throat> um, is that um, over the long run, uh, growth must be determined by either you increase the quantity of the factors of production 
or you improve the technology. So growth can be induced by uh, increase the quantity of capital, quantity of labor, or technology. Orthodox usually use a production function. Uh, so really it's just a micro production function at the aggregate level where uh, output is equal to A, which stands for technology, uh, plus the, um, the quantity of capital and the quantity of labor that grow through time. We assume there are constant returns to scale, perfect competition, factor inputs return, earn a return based on their marginal productivity. We assume Cobb-Douglas, and then we take the, product, the, the derivative of that. So we get the growth of income, uh, dy over y, equals the share of employment and output, which is one minus V times the growth of labor, plus the share of capital and output, which is V times the growth of capital, plus the improvement of technology. Okay, so this is a straight neoclassical uh, version of what they were trying to do. And this became interpreted as the neoclassical growth model. Why do they use Cobb Douglas and all this? Because it has this nice characteristic that you can do this so that you can um, allocate uh, the contribution according to the shares of labor and um, capital and output. Okay, <clears throat> uh, various uh, orthodox economists beginning with Solo, tried to use this framework to estimate actual real world growth. And they find that after, or Solo first found that after growth of labor hours, uh, they're still up to 80% unexplained uh, of growth. And uh, after some revisions to uh, his uh, estimates, he's able to explain about 50%. And so the unexplained part must be technical progress. So that's the idea. Actually, what it measures, of course, is uh, all of your error. Um, maybe your specification isn't right. Maybe you're not measuring the factors of production correctly. Maybe uh, a production function approach is just wrong. Uh, it's a measure of your ignorance, really. <laughs> <clears throat> so over the years, people have uh, uh, improved it in the sense that the unexplained part gets smaller and smaller. Uh, Denison finds about a third is due to technical progress. Robert Gordon has, has a, a really a great book in many ways, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, um, in that... Uh, he discusses a lot of the real world stuff that really mattered, but still in the back of his mind, he has this framework, uh, which is really a supply side approach to uh, aggregate, to economic growth. And um, uh, I think that that is the main flaw of the book. Again, I don't wanna go into that, but I just pointed out that um, uh, this sort of work continues. So it all assumes that labor's share of income accurately reflects labor's contribution to production. That is, it assumes that marginal productivity theory is correct. Okay. Uh, Anwar Sheikh uh, in 1974 wrote this famous paper, the humbug production function, which I'll come back to, which um, explains why the uh, empirical work looks pretty good. And, but first, I want to go into the um, Cambridge critique of this approach. Okay, so the Herod model, I'm not going to go through all the math. I'm just going to give the assumptions and then skip to the conclusion right here. Uh, <clears throat> saving is equal to the uh, average propensity to save, which is the same as the marginal propensity to save because we're doing the long run model, times income. The labor force grows at a constant rate in. There's no technical progress. We can add it in, but this just keeps it simpler. There's no depreciation of capital. Again, it can be added in, but this keeps the math simple. The production function has fixed coefficients of labor and capital. So production of one unit of output 
requires a fixed amount of capital and a fixed amount of labor. To double output, you have to double each input. Again, this uh, keeps things simple. Uh, we let, um, oh, here I'm letting U be the labor uh, output ratio. Usually it's one minus V. And V is the capital output ratio. And we do all the math and we get to the conclusion, which is that uh, D, the, the rate of growth of output has to be equal to the ratio of the propensity to save to the capital output ratio. It must grow at that same rate through time to make sure that investment equals saving through time. This will ensure the, the demand side of your economy is growing at the same pace as the supply side, which means you get to use all the capital that you produced. We don't have a tendency towards secular stagnation. So this is the necessary condition to avoid having too much capital or too little capital, okay? Now, since we assume that the saving rate and the desired capital output ratio are constants, then the growth rate also has to be constant in order to keep investment equal to saving and have the right amount of um, uh, capital, no excess, no shortage. Now, as to your question, is this loanable funds? The answer is no, it's not loanable funds. This is a necessary condition for the demand side and supply side to grow at the same pace. So right. no, he did not fall into a loanable funds theory The saving is financing investment, okay? Okay, brilliant. All right. Um, Domar's model is very similar. I actually like Domar better, but people are more familiar with Herod. So I'm, I'm presenting Herod. We can do a very similar thing with uh, Domar, and then we can show that they are mathematically equivalent results. Right. Okay. So then um, uh, Joan Robinson comes along and says, you know, it's very unlikely that this is going to happen. It's very unlikely we're going to have exactly the right growth rate. And so uh, she lays out uh, three different growth rates, the warranted growth rate, the natural growth rate, and the actual growth rate. So the warranted growth rate, GW, is S over V. Okay, that, that's the necessary rate of growth to ensure that the level of the capital stock is exactly that which firms require given the current level of output. It keeps the capital output ratio constant. If the economy grows at this rate, there's no reason for firms to try to reduce or increase the capital stock growth rate because it's the right growth rate. If the economy grew slower, you'd have too much capital, not enough demand. If it grew faster, you wouldn't have enough capital. So this is the, the only growth rate that works, okay? The, it keeps you on equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium path where demand is growing equal to supply. Then there's the natural growth rate, which is the growth rate of the labor force. If the economy grows faster than that, you run out of workers. If the economy grows slower, you get unemployment. So if uh, the... GN equals GW, then you're growing with full employment. And then finally, the actual rate of growth is GA. It's whatever the economy is actually growing. The golden age occurs where these three things are equal. So your actual growth rate is equal to your warranted growth rate, and that is equal to the rate of growth of your labor force. Right. If the uh, actual doesn't equal the warranted, then the actual capital stock is not equal to the desired stock. If the actual doesn't equal the natural, then you're not at full employment, either too little or too much labor. But S, V, and N are all independently determined. So, so there's no reason to believe 
that we're going to get the golden age. It's a sheer coincidence. Okay, that's bad enough <laughs> that it requires a sheer coincidence. But it's worse than that. Because if you're not there, you won't go there. There's nothing that stabilizes you. It's a knife edge, okay? So there's a stability problem. If the warranted doesn't equal the actual, you probably won't move to equilibrium. You'll move further and further away. If the warranted is above the actual, you're growing too slowly. Firms have more capital than they want because output is lower than they expected. So what do they do? Reduce investment. What does that do? Slows growth even more. So you fall away from the warranted rate. You move to a slower and slower growth rate. What happens if the actual is above the warranted? Now firms have less capital than they want because output's higher than they expected. So they invest more. So what happens? You grow even faster. So you grow farther and farther above the warranted rate. So it's a knife edge property. You're only stable if you happen to be there. Okay, so it's the worst outcome you can get. Um, if we add in technological growth, I said we can do it. Uh, then we're adding another variable that is independent. And so it's even less likely. Uh, your growth rate is going to have to be higher than the labor force growth rate to keep your labor fully employed. So it makes it, the stability even harder. Okay, so that, uh, that finishes what they were trying to do. Okay, <clears throat> and then... There are two problems with this. One is the real world is unstable, but it's not that unstable, right? This knife edge property would make you think you either go to infinity or zero because you're not likely to be on the knife edge. So there must be something that prevents you from falling off the cliff or going you know, to the stars. Right. And the second is that um, if you're a good neoclassical economist, you believe it's the market that keeps you in equilibrium. So Solo comes along. I'll, I'll come back to the first one later. What is it that keeps you on? Uh, it keeps you near enough to the knife edge. Because uh, Min Minsky had an answer to that. Right. But Solo had a neoclassical answer. It's the market that does it. And so... He says the economy has to be more stable than that. And there must be some market mechanism that will move you back to your equilibrium growth path. So he, you know, he's thinking, uh, what if the propensity to save is too high given the growth of the labor force and the capital income ratio, then you're gonna have too much saving. Well, what happens if you have too much saving? The interest rate goes down because it's loanable funds. So this is where the loanable funds is. It's not in Domar, it's in Solo, okay? Who right. should know better because he's supposed to be a Keynesian, right? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Those are the books, Budget, Harrod, Domar, um, as usual. I mean, they budget Keynes, so I'm not surprised. So anyway, the, um, uh, the interest rate is going to fall and uh, that's the cost of capital so firms want to use more capital relative to labor. So uh, what Solo is saying is the problem with the Domar model is the capital output ratio is fixed. But he's saying it won't be fixed because if capital gets relatively cheaper, then you're gonna switch and use more capital and less labor. If labor gets uh, cheaper, you will switch and use more labor than capital. So it's because the factors of production, uh, uh, how the quantity you use of each depends on the, the cost of those. So that's the market mechanism working. So anyway, as the interest rate goes down, you use more capital relative to labor. So you switch to a capital intensive production process. Firms are glad to have more capital. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's because you're happy with the greater capital, uh, 
you don't try to change that uh, the amount of investment uh, to reduce it. You want more investment, so you you remain in equilibrium. On the other hand, if the propensity to save is too low, then the interest rate is driven up. So firms use less capital and more labor. So they switch to a labor intensive production process. So the conclusions of taking this approach that Sol is taking is that we always stay at full capacity. Growth is stable. Market forces move the economy to an equilibrium growth path. And it's the propensity to save that is driving the system, not investment. It's a propensity to save because it causes the interest rate to adjust. It's a loanable funds argument. So then this leads to uh, two kinds of critiques. Uh, the first is the Cambridge controversies, Robinson and Sraffa. Now Sraffa in 1926 had already destroyed the marginal productivity theory. Uh, this is brought back uh, in, uh, with his book in 1960 and uh, by Joan Robinson, uh, who showed that it's not true that the desired capital output ratio depends on the interest rate. A falling interest rate won't necessarily lead to a greater substitution of capital. They essentially showed that the uh, analysis that uses capital and labor as factors of production with returns determined by their marginal productivity is illogical. Now, part of the problem is that capital is heterogeneous. How do you measure it? How can you measure the marginal product of capital? You can only measure it on the basis of expected profits because it's heterogeneous. You can't use weight or something like that. It has to be its profitability. And you have to know the price of capital in order to calculate a profit rate. But you can't derive a price of capital without knowing the profit rate. Okay, so you've got this, you know, endless circle. The profit rate can't be determined from the demand and supply of capital. So marginal analysis in general. So this critique, it, it was all about, it's called the capital controversy but it's equally true of labor. And Keynes made a mistake in the general theory where he said he would accept the postulate that the wage equals the marginal product of labor. Uh, and this made Sraffa furious <laughs> because in 26, he'd already shown that marginal productivity theory is completely illogical. You cannot derive uh, nice sloping functions of uh, labor uh, against labor demand against the wage. And now this debate is all about the interest rate and capital. Uh, it can be shown that as interest rates and wages change, you switch techniques and uh, in, in ways that violate demand curves. So you can't expect a monotonic relationship between the interest rate and capital, okay? Right. Uh, now, eventually, uh, uh, Solo admitted, Solo and Samuelson admitted that uh, uh, the Cambridge England side was correct and the Cambridge US side was wrong. Okay. But it's made no difference whatsoever. <laughs> uh, right. Fascinating. I think it was in a paper called Summing Up, but what Samuelson just says is the, the simple tale that uh, neoclassical is taught isn't as it is and uh it's sad but then he just went on to keep on teaching <laughs> the same stuff and thank you i'll come to you in just a second yeah. so um so is that okay well our theory is incoherent uh but when you use a cobb douglas production function it fits the data really well <laughs> you know that's what my lecturer said when i brought the cambridge controversies up in regards to the production okay. function so, so here's the answer you want to give them, you know, and and so Mank you in his textbook, uh, he says it's just amazing how the, good the correlation is. He never mentions the Cambridge controversy, and probably in truth, he's never heard of it. <laughs> it. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he's never heard they lost this debate. Um, but anyway, what Shake showed 
uh, in 74 is it's an algebraic equality. Uh, so this is a long quote, but so long as aggregate shares are constant. And this is one of Caldor's um, empirical you know, regularities, uh, uh, a fact that labor and capital shares change very, very slowly, okay? And uh, until the past 20 years in the United States, the, uh, the shares were very, very constant. So as long as the, those aggregate shares are constant and aggregate Cobb-Douglas uh, production function having apparently constant returns to scale will always provide an exact fit for any data whatsoever, will seem to also possess marginal products equal to respective factor rewards. And he shows this is true for any data, including uh, uh, any kind of economy. And so what he did was he uh, created a production function that spells out humbug to create the data, then uses the um, Cobb-Douglas production function to estimate a fit, and it's perfect, <laughs> okay? So it just shows it's not due to any law of economics, it's due to the laws of algebra. If you estimate an identity, you get a very good fit. So in a, Solo actually wrote a response uh, to Shake, and he said, I'm paraphrasing. He didn't use exactly these words, okay. Well, I wasn't testing aggregate production functions or marginal products or anything else. I was just showing how to interpret empirical evidence if you start by assuming the data were generated from a good neoclassical production function. <laughs> it's as funny as you could get, right? And then Mankiw says this is proof that the Cobb-Douglas produ production function uh, fits reality, right? Just because a, we're assuming, <laughs> we're assuming that the data came out of it. Anyway, uh, and uh, you you notice the whole real real business cycle literature, they gained credence because they used a Cobb Douglas production function and came up with an explanation, uh, and used the the good fit to show that real business cycle theory is true, right? <laughs> Yeah. So it's still it's still used in spite of shake showing you're estimating um, identities. All right, uh, that is it on that topic. Do you have any? Questions? Yeah, I mean, so I, I guess the, the what's the alternative, right? For, for post Keynesians, we're not going to use Cobb Douglas. I know for the short run, we can <laughs> tend to use the Leontief production functions, um, but when you look at the long term economic growth like what's the alternative well i i don't think uh that production aggregate production functions are a way to do anything at all right. uh, i think you know the the things that work well are um stock flow consistent modeling with a wind godly sectoral balances approach uh I would do that uh, instead of um, uh, using production functions. Right, and there's a lot of calls to incorporate energy into into growth theory uh, and just production theory generally, even like just the, the circular flow of income. Uh, what are your opinions on that? I, I'm not sure what that is. Like as an input into production. I, I don't have an opinion. I mean, I think we need to um, worry about environmental impacts of growth uh, and, uh, um, you know, move toward environmental sustainability. Uh, and I don't think we should uh, promote growth for growth's sake anyway. Uh, I think it's very important to you know, to, to watch what's going on in the economy and, and try to be prepared for an oncoming financial crisis, which right. I think uh, we are facing. Um, but I, I don't think production functions help you at all. I, I think godly sectoral balances, watch what, what's going on in the private sector um, as far as um, their saving rates and the, their debt ratios. 
I think is helpful. So looking at financial data instead of, um, you know, real productivity, I think is what's important. Do you think there's any um, use in taking Srafa's um, input-output method and developing it further in, in post-Keynesian economics? Do you think there's a well, potential for new analysis there? Yeah, input-output analysis. It, so if you're talking about a developing country and you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, which areas should they invest in? Where do they already have some strengths? Which is the inputs, right? You know, which, uh, you know, what, what kinds of uh, characteristics does their labor force have? What kinds of natural resources do they have? Uh, I think input output analysis is um, uh, very good. It doesn't have to be Srafian. Um, it was always I, quite, quite a lot more complicated. I think the, the appeal of neoclassical economics is how simple it is, uh, at least with all the maps, just, just the diagrams and whatnot. You get into Srafa, it's, it's really hard to wrap your head, or head around it. So I think the students, um, I mean, even for the, the professors themselves, I think there's a reason why they just keep sticking to neoclassical equilibrium theory and all of that and just measure capital as if it's some, some substance that you can keep adding on on and on yeah, putty putty <laughs> putty and clay yes yeah I, yeah i know but i, I think um th there there also is a very strong belief that markets work and i think that is what heterodox uh rejects the, yeah. that 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 whole uh framework is just wrong markets don't work that way uh, there's no, there is no invisible hand, which Keynes had already said uh, in his end of laissez-faire. He, 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 he didn't know what to replace it with in 1926, but he knew that was wrong. Okay. Uh, and, you know, now we have another hundred years of evidence that it's just wrong. Markets do not work that way. Financial markets don't work that way. And the, the production side of our economy doesn't work that way. Okay, uh, let's get on to the next stuff. Okay, so now gradually, uh, I'll be moving to uh, Minsky. <clears throat> so let's start with uh, Keynes's theory of investment. So before we were saying we're, we're taking it as a, um, you know, autonomous exogenous given, uh, but Keynes does have a theory of how investment is determined. And uh, the best place for this is chapter 17 of the general theory, uh, although it's very difficult uh, going. I'm, I'm gonna simplify, I'm not gonna do the, the full blown theory of asset pricing. Uh, there are other places in the general theory where he has a much more simplified approach. So that's what I'm using here uh, to, uh, Get behind the investment decision. So uh, Keynes uh, formulates what he calls the marginal efficiency of capital. This is not marginal productivity of capital. So it's not physical output. It is the uh, money returns you can get from investing in capital. So it's a money return, not a physical return. Some people accuse Keynes wrongly of having some kind of marginal productivity theory. He didn't. This is all in dollars or pounds, uh, whatever. I suppose that's why so Lerner preferred to call the marginal efficiency of investment, right? Well, there, there's marginal efficiency of investment, marginal efficiency of capital. There's some debate about this. And I guess Harcourt is probably one of the best sources if you want to read up on it. So uh, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, uh, we'll keep it simple. Marginal efficiency of capital. It's equal to the rate of discount that'll make the present value of a series of annuities. So these are the, the pounds in the future or dollars in the future given by the returns expected from the capital asset during its life, just equal to the supply price. Um, so, and then he goes on to say, uh, we calculate the marginal efficiency of a variety of types of capital assets that we might invest in. The greatest of the marginal efficiencies is then uh, taken to be the marginal efficiency of capital in general. What does it mean? 
So investment is going to yield a, a series of expected returns. He calls them Qs for quasi rent, which comes from Marshall. So in year one, we have Q1. Year two, we have Q2. On out to the final year, QN. No reason why the Q is the same in every year. Probably in the, in the first year, uh, it's going to be low uh, as you know, you're introducing some product to the market. And then the Qs increase, and then maybe uh, they start dropping off towards the end. So we can have different Qs in each year. What we have to do then is discount those back to the present to compare them to the price of buying the capital and decide whether it's worth it to buy the capital. So we discount back and compare to the supply price. We find the uh, marginal efficiency of capital that just makes the expected returns equal to the supply price. That's one way of doing it. Uh, that's, I think, the best way to do it. But he also says you can compare the MEC to the interest rate, uh, the market interest rate, and then invest only where the MEC is greater than the interest rate. Uh, I don't like this one as much. And uh, Vicky Chick in her, I think, a 1986 book on uh, Keynes, uh, goes through examples where these don't necessarily give you the same answer. Uh, right. the, the first one is much more consistent with his argument in chapter 17. So that's the one that I would prefer to use. So we uh, calculate the MECs and then compare them against the supply price of capital. I got, I got two questions on that. Okay. Um, and there re in regards to, I guess, where, where you touch on the interest rate. Um, so I suppose if it's above the interest rate, go ahead and invest is the basic idea. But of course, the MEC itself can shift in response to aggregate demand conditions in the economy. Uh, I know Warren Mosler talks a lot about the interest income effect. Would you say that um, any change in the interest rate wouldn't be a mechanical sort of um, effect because the interest rate itself can um, shift the MEC? Well, um, you're, you're making this decision ex ante, like right now. So uh, you're comparing it to the current rate of interest. Okay, so you're making the, the decision today. Do I hold a financial asset and get interest? Or do I buy a capital asset and get the cues? That, that, that's the second method here. Uh, now, it begs the question, which interest rate, right? <laughs> Says the interest rate. What interest rate are you going to use? Um, that's why I don't like this one. The other one, what we're doing is we're looking at all <clears throat> possible assets that we can hold, including financial assets. And then we are calculating the expected returns. And in chapter 17, those expected returns include the Q less the carrying cost plus the liquidity premium, okay? And that makes it possible to compare a financial asset, any financial asset, against any physical asset. Because you compare the total returns, Q minus C plus L. Uh, so it's, it's a much more complicated and I think much more appealing approach than the simple one where you compare the MEC against an interest rate. Okay. okay. Um, I suppose my second question will also be quite similar. And if you go back to the reswitching argument, um, that capital intensity, well, it could be really high at a given interest rate, and then as it increases, it lowers, but then it gets high again. Um, would that also be an argument against the mechanistic way of viewing interest rates and investment? I, uh, I would say yes. <laughs> um, again, we we need a a way to compare 
uh, the return, expected returns of every possible thing we can hold through time. And that's what chapter 17 is doing. So it's much more complicated than this uh, graph here. And uh, then we make a choice depending on our expectations. Now you could ask, well, what happens if your expectations change? Well, of course, then you would make a different decision. And um, there's, there's no reason why the decision you made yesterday uh, would be the same as the one you make today. And there's no reason why the decision you made yesterday uh, it turns out to have been a mistake. You can make mistakes. In the general, Craigle has a paper where he, he talks about the three different methods in the general theory. So the simplest one is to assume that um, whatever you expected turns out to be true. And, and so you never second guess. And that's Keynes's preferred method in the general theory. Um, but he also uh, does allow for you uh, to find out it was a mistake. That's the second method. And then the third is uh, you, you find out it was a mistake, but you don't change your behavior. And then the third one is you find out it was a mistake, and so you change your behavior. The third one is the, by far the most realistic one. It's the one he uses the least. But the reason he uses it less is because if he can show you don't get full employment, even if your expectations are always fulfilled, that's the strongest possible argument against Pagu. Strongest argument against neoclassical economics. Because if you're saying that unemployment exists because firms made a mistake, that's a weak argument. Because in the long run, you figure, well, they'll learn from making mistakes. But if you say that um, even if they don't make a mistake, there's nothing to push you to full employment, okay? You're, they, all, they did the best that they could do. And it turned out their expectations were completely fulfilled. And still we didn't have full employment. That's the strongest argument you can make against neoclassical theory. So that's why he usually assumed that even though it's not realistic. Right. Okay. All right. Um, in chapter, uh, chapter, there are chapter 17 post-Keynesians and there are chapter 12 post-Keynesians. <laughs> the chapter 17 post-Keynesians, we were talking about uh, equilibrium. Chapter 17 is an equilibrium chapter. Okay. I... Uh, you know, you're making decisions and um, you're coming to a point of effective demand, depending on how much investment there is. Chapter 12 is a disequilibrium chapter. So the post-Keynesians who don't like equilibrium love chapter 12 uh, because it's all about, you know, the speculation, whirlwinds of optimism and pessimism. Um, that uh, doesn't seem to be about equilibrium at all. It's about great instability. So he defines uh, enterprise as trying to forecast the prospective yield or the life of an asset um, versus speculation, which is trying to forecast the psychology of the market, where you're trying to outguess average opinion. And he says that when enterprise dominates, you get relative stability. When speculation dominates, you get great instability, okay? And the problem is that as investment markets, he's talking about the stock market, as the stock market develops and improves, speculation increasingly dominates. Um, and that's a big problem because now, uh, you're going to be focused on speculating instead of investing uh, in plant and equipment for the long run. So speculation uh, and bubbles on a steady stream of enterprise is okay, but when speculation starts to dominate over enterprise, then you're in big trouble. So he talks about ways that you might make the stock market less unstable. 
and it sounds something like a Tobin tax. He says we could make a stock ownership more like a marriage so it, it lasts longer, or we can impose a, a, a cost of getting out. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, economic prosperity relies excessively on a spontaneous urge to action. What he means is that you're confident enough to invest because investment is the driver of the system. Um, if investment relied only on close calculation, we would have too little. And the reason is because if you think about it too carefully, you would never invest because the future is too uncertain. So we need a spontaneous urge to invest in order to have a decent economy with economic growth. And what this means is that the politicians uh, always have to favor the business man, let's say business person, uh, in order to keep them optimistic so that they will invest. So we're, we're sort, of, sort of beholden to the capitalists. Everything we do has to please them and keep them happy, or we don't have a decent economy. And Keynes wants to change that. So in chapter 24, he talks about socializing investment so that we don't have to rely so much on the business person uh, and uh, doing everything possible to keep them happy. He, he also uh, says in this chapter that you can't really solve the problem with monetary policy. Okay, you uh, it's going to require um, fiscal policy, sp the spending side, not the monetary side of government, because you can't counter the wide swings of the marginal efficiency of capital, uh, which swings because of optimism and pessimism up and down. You can't counter that by changing the interest rate. The MEK can fall too fast and too far for you to offset that by lowering the interest rate through monetary policy. So we're gonna to have to rely on fiscal policy. I mean, neoclassicals keep emphasizing the role of expectations and that the interest rate is the main driver of expectations. What would you say to, to that? Uh, well, it certainly didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had zero and even negative on government debt um, and could not induce investment. Uh, and a recovery from the global financial crisis. See, the, the problem is uh, there's no, no limit to how low the MEK can go. I always ask my uh, students, even graduate students, can the MEK, the marginal efficiency of capital, go negative? You know, and they usually say, no. They say, well, hold a second. You can't think of investments that will be losers that give you negative profits? Of course you can. It's easy to come up with those, you know, fur-bearing trout farms. Let's grow trout in the pond and harvest their fur for winter coats. That's a, going to be a sure loser. <laughs> so there, there's no lower limit to the MEK. And the problem in 2010 was every possible investment you could make had a negative return. So it does no good having a zero interest rate, okay? Um, and that's why it won't work. Right. All right. A funny point about the speculation as Keynes came up with his analogy called the, the Keynesian beauty contest, yeah. where the idea isn't to, to find out which, stock, which company is going to perform best to invest in them. It's more like finding out what the public opinion is. So if you choose between the six prettiest faces, you'd lose because you'd think I have to choose the six faces that the public is going to find the most prettiest. When you can have like a third order, fourth order version of this where you think that, well, the public already knows I'm going to think like this. I'm going to have to outwit them. <laughs> so um, it is a, he had a funny way of writing, Keynes did. And, and, you know, that is the way the Fed operates now. They're trying to outguess average opinion and, in order to control average opinion. They, they've got themselves, you know, all wrapped up in a little ball <laughs> where they, they do things that they don't really want to do in order to try to influence opinions. Try and that's how monetary policy... What? Trying to play 4D chess. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 
that's how monetary policy works today. They're, they're just chasing their own tail um, and it does not work. So they, uh, they were trying to get inflation expectations up to 2%. They could not do it for 10 years. Um, and, and, now, and, and they always claimed expectations determine inflation. Okay, and so inflation in the U.S. goes to 8% and expected inflation is three. <laughs> it's clear expectations are not causing inflation. Okay, and, and expectations are still low, even though we've had a year of high inflation. Everyone expects them to go back down. Uh, and so the, the Fed has had to abandon this belief that expectations determine inflation because it's clearly wrong. And it's always been wrong. Okay. Even Expect in the seventies, because because the big argument was in the seventies we got stagflation, because inflation expectations came into line with um, well the actual inflation. Yeah, well that was wrong. That <laughs> isn't true. <laughs> the, we had inflation because OPEC quadrupled the price of oil, and uh, oil j just like uh, happened recently, uh, and oil feeds into food with a little bit of a lag because food prices are 70% oil prices. Oh. Then the final component was shelter costs. Uh, those three components drove inflation. It had nothing to do with expectations. Expectations eventually converge to reality, not the other way around. Reality does not converge to expectations. Expectations converge to reality, at least for everyone who's in, who is sane. OK, there, there are people for 2000 years who have been expecting a second coming of Christ. It has not happened. Well, I suppose they would emphasize the fact that taxation was accelerating rather than just increasing from the oil shock. And that was due to expectations. It, it was uh, largely shelter and food because food is with a lag. One, once you have increased the costs of planting your crops, and pouring the fertilizer on them and uh, the pesticides, you've got to recover those costs. And, and in addition, uh, there were uh, geopolitical reasons why we were exporting uh, wheat uh, to the Soviet Union. Uh, those two things, oil prices and exports, uh, help drive up uh, the price of food. Um, and then shelter in the United States is very complexly determined. Um, it's not expectations. And, you know, if it was just expectations, why is inflation global? Uh, so people say, well, you know, Biden caused it. Uh, <laughs> but hold a second. Biden did not send checks to everybody in the world. It only happened in America. Uh, but inflation is global. Why? Well, food and oil. Um, he in the UK and, would appreciate some of those checks right now. <laughs> you, so say what? Would appreciate some of the checks he in the UK right now. Oh, yeah. Biden could send them over. And then, uh, of course, if the US raises interest rates, everyone does. And uh, that helps to um, uh, depreciate currencies and cause inflation in foreign countries. So, it, so some of it does come back because of uh, U.S. behavior, but it, it wasn't expectations. It was the Fed that did that. Okay, we better move. Okay, uh, Koleski's model of investment. The only reason I want to present this is because of the uh, profits equation, uh, because I'll need that uh, later talking about Minsky. Uh, probably most people are familiar with it. You, If you start at the aggregate level with GDP equals income, uh, you can um, uh, balance the spending side and the income side uh, and get down to the uh, profits equation in the simple model with no government and no uh, foreign sector. Profits are identically equal to Consumption out of profits plus investment. So the way that um, Kleski put it is capitals get what they spend. Uh, whatever they spend on consumption comes back to them in the form of profits. Whatever they spend on investment comes back to them in the form of profits. Um, so capitalist spending uh, determines profits. 
What this means is profits are determined in the aggregate level. It's not determined by uh, competitive behavior, by market power, anything like that. And the aggregate is determined by uh, what capital is spent. If we expand the model to uh, include government spending and net exports, and then of course taxes too, then we get uh, the, the full blown profits equation, which is that uh, profits net of taxes are equal to investment plus G minus T, which is the government's deficit plus net exports plus consumption out of profits minus saving out of wages. Uh, as a um, simplifying assumption, Kleski assumed that this is zero and out in the real world, it is about zero because workers don't earn enough to save. So uh, that one can usually be ignored. Consumption out of profits uh, usually is also assumed to be zero because capitalists exist to invest. They don't exist to consume. Um, and so we get down to gross profit, or sorry, uh, net profits at the aggregate level are equal to the investment plus the deficit plus net exports. Why is this? Basically, it's because these are kinds of spending uh, that are not, um, uh, that are additional demands on output that are not expenses of capitalists who produce the consumer goods. So that is why they generate profit. They generate e extra income to um, the capitalists. Uh, so we're going to use this uh, when we get to um, Minsky. Minsky's early contributions in the 1950s, um, he uh, had three important papers in the 1950s that sort of laid the groundwork for his later work. First, <clears throat> innovation is endogenous and responds to profit opportunity. Now, Schumpeter was Minsky's dissertation advisor until he died. And um, uh, Schumpeter, of course, is famous for innovation. What Minsky did was he extended innovation to the financial sector. Uh, Schumpeter was all about innovation in the, you know, the so-called real sector. And um, Minsky made innovation in the financial sector responsive to profits. So if there's a profit opportunity, uh, the financial sector innovates in order to take advantage of that. He uh, talked about the uh, development of the Fed funds market, which is in the United States, that's our inner bank lending market where banks lend reserves to each other. And um, uh, that led to a version of endogenous money, arguing the central bank cannot control the uh, quantity of bank lending by controlling the quantity of reserves because banks can economize on reserves. So they can make loans even if central bank is trying to constrain the growth of reserves. And the Fed funds market was an example of how banks economize on reserves. Any bank with extra reserves can lend them to banks that need more reserves. The problem is innovation stretches the liquidity of banks and increases fragility. So the, um, the uh, banks will have fewer liquid assets uh, relative to illiquid assets like loans, uh, which before the, the era of securitization, uh, you couldn't get loans off your balance sheet. So once you made a loan, you were stuck with it, relatively illiquid. And that will increase financial fragility. Uh, <clears throat> intervention by the government, uh, it could be the treasury, but usually it's the central bank, will validate innovations. So the idea is banks innovate that increase fragility to a breaking point. They get in trouble and then the government bails them out, uh, intervenes, and that validates the innovations so they continue doing them. If the, the government didn't do that, if the innovation led to failure, 
they would drop the innovation, but they don't drop the innovations because uh, the government intervenes. Yeah, the, that's one page. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so he recognized the money was endogenous. What if in the um, gold standard days, because this is the 1950s, we had like an international gold standard in terms of Bretton Woods, but mm -hmm. especially before 1934, we had um, a fixed exchange rate, even domestically. Uh, does that constrain bank lending? Does that ensure the banks act more like the vulnerable funds theory approach would pretend like they do? No, not, not for Minsky. Uh, as far as I remember, he never talked about the gold standard that way. It constrains fiscal policy. So, so the gold standard does not constrain banking. They can, because my thinking is that if, if there's a gold standard, banks just won't get reserves on demand like they do now. Um, and then they'd have to be more careful with, with lending. But the, the banks don't have to provide gold. Okay. They only have to provide reserves. And the central bank can always provide reserves if banks need them. The central bank can always be a lender of last resort, even on a gold standard. Uh, but it constrains fiscal policy so that uh, the... Uh, you you worry about your um, pressure on the exchange rate if the economy is growing too fast. So that's I'm more worried. Responsive. Everyone wants to withdraw gold, uh, gold from the deposit, which is what happened. <laughs> right. In, in the uh, when uh, when France decided uh, to break the dollar, um, Nixon went off gold. Uh, right. Minsky saw that as a constraint, definitely. And um, so not a topic that I'm going to do today, Minsky advocated a job guarantee and he recognized the gold standard could be a constraint on implementing a, uh, the job guarantee. So when we, when we went off gold, he said, we have finally removed the last constraint that prevents us from having a job guarantee. So he saw it as a fiscal constraint. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> other uh, paper in 1957, he used that um, multiplier accelerator model of Samuelson, uh, but instead of having a neoclassical stabilizer, his stabilizer was institutions. So he argued that the um, with a, a multiplier accelerator model, the uh, economy <clears throat> will um could cycle and they could be explosive cycles there's no reason why they're in you know a nice um uh constrained cycle but we have um ceilings and floors so a ceiling means a limit to how fast you can grow a floor means how far you can fall down uh over the course of the business cycle and those ceilings and floors are institutional constraints. So instead of the market being stable, the market's unstable, but we stabilize the market by uh, instituting institutions. And I'll talk about more uh, in a minute uh, about how the government provides institutions that stabilize the market processes but just for right now, let me say, Minsky didn't argue that it's only the government. The market itself can create ceilings and floors. And an example is uh, in the stock market, you can suspend trading. If prices fall too much in one day, what do you do? You stop it. Okay, you suspend trading. You try opening the next day and see if markets have cooled down. If they haven't, you keep it closed, right? And then you try this the third day. If things have settled down, then you allow trading to occur. So that, that's a, a market in, market created institution that stabilizes a naturally unstable market process, which is when uh, crypto is falling, what happens? You sell, right? So you need something to prevent uh the market from going to zero. So very different from Samuelson's yeah. solo. Yep. So when it comes to like the Great Depression that preceded 
the Great Depression, like the Long Depression after 1893, the one after 1873. Like what what, what got us out of it? Because at the time, government institutions were very, like they barely existed. There, there was no central <clears throat> bank. Yeah. There was no fiscal policy. Well, not much <clears throat> anyway. So what, what kind of got us out of that? Well, you, um, what happens is, M Minsky, you talked about this, that without the government, what happens in a depression is it has to go on long enough until you have simplified the financial system. What does that mean? Most of the financial sector fails. Right. Okay. You, you go as low as you possibly can. And then it, it could be you, you've had, um, you know, negative net investment for a long enough period of time that the capacity has been destroyed. And, you know, there's always some consumption going on. And you, you finally reach the, the limit of uh, how much capacity you had to destroy in order to induce some new investment. And that will get you going again. And the advantage you have is there's no debt because anyone who had debt has already defaulted. So now you get to start again with a simplified financial system, not much debt, only equity, and an incentive to invest because you wiped out capacity. That's what we used to do. Okay, and then in the uh, in the Great Depression, that's the path we were headed on uh, until the New Deal and World War II. That's what got us out. Do you say there was any Samuelsonian and uh, Samuelsonian multiplier accelerator dynamic going on that would get us back to well. To once the investment starts increasing, yeah, uh, slowly, yeah, you can get on a path to recovery. Right. Okay. And j just one other thing. Remember, we crashed in 1907 too, and we didn't have a central bank. So you guys did, but we didn't. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so J.P. Morgan got all the big bankers into one room and locked the door and said, "You guys are not leaving this room." <laughs> until we get an agreement you know we got to bail each other out and then they started working to create the fed so that they wouldn't have to do it again the next time so that, that's an example of the market coming together and creating a, an institution that we protect protect each other which some crypto people are trying to do now right because there's no central bank for crypto and so they're trying to see if they can do what um, J.P. Morgan did. The first attempt failed. <laughs> we'll see if the second one uh, can succeed. That's interesting because before the central bank was created, we had an era of, of free banking where banks like to offer their own their own notes, basically. How did that work? Well, that's what we did. <clears throat> we had the worst banking history of any country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a depression every 20 years. In the 19th century, every 20 years, we had a depression um, with bank runs. Uh, that's what happens if you don't have a central bank. So you guys learned your lesson earlier than we did. You you read uh, Bajet, and the Bank of England started acting as a lender of last resort, but we didn't have... Uh, uh, if banks uh, issue their own notes, how, how do bank runs work? Because we're not... Can't they just print their own notes in, in response to... Uh, but, because they usually make them convertible into something. So right. okay. Bank of England. England. Yeah. Well, no, they made them convertible into Bank of England notes. All right. Yeah. And they had done that for a long time. And the Bank of England did not act as a lender of last resort. So you had bank runs. Uh, and then finally, after uh, Bajet, they the Bank of England started acting like a central bank. But before, they always would call in their notes. If there was a run on the country banks, the Bank of England would call in its own notes, uh, making things worse because nobody had notes <laughs> to do the conversion. Then they realized, oh no, we don't call in notes. What we would do is we lend notes. If you lend your notes, then the banks can do the redemption. I presume in America, those bank notes were redeemable in, in dollars, but that there was no central bank to offer dollars on demand. 
when that closes. Or they, they, they could be redeemable into private notes too. Um, but, uh, and I suppose uh, coins, and yes, we, we had um, uh, treasury notes that they could make them redeemable for. Okay, uh, the, the last point is Minsky is writing in the 50s. He says, okay, we have these ceilings and floors in place. These institutions are stabilizing the economy. Uh, but the problem is stability is destabilizing. This is one of his most famous uh, quotes. And uh, it probably came from Ava Lerner. Um, it was a, a, a phrase he picked up from Ava Lerner. Maybe he was describing Minsky's theory and uh, Minsky's associated with that. So anyway, the, he was predicting that although, although things are stable now, our financial system is very uh, simple and safe, that will change because of the innovations that are gradually going to stretch uh, fragility and uh, a crisis. Uh, we will start to have crises again. We, we went for probably our longest period ever without a financial crisis. Our first one was 1966, and it was very small. In the 70s, we started having more serious financial crises. But that's a period from World War II uh, until the 70s. Uh, we didn't really have financial crises for the first time in our history. Um, but he predicted they would come back. Extensions <clears throat> in the 60s and 70s, this is when he develops the... Um, financial instability hypothesis. So uh, he writes the book, John Maynard Keynes, where he presents the financial theory of investment. So what Minsky said is Keynes developed an investment theory of the cycle. And what was lacking was a financial theory of investment. So we have a financial theory of investment and investment theory of the cycle. He used a two price system approach. This is this comes out of chapter 17 of the general theory. We have a price system for current output, including capital, and then a price system for assets. And it's the interplay between these two systems of prices uh, that generates investment. So the demand price of capital has to be greater than the supply price of capital, which comes out of the current output price system in order to have investment occur. So that's why it's a financial theory of investment. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, and then uh, he also included lenders and borrowers risk, which came out of Koleski, as well as Koleski's view of profits. This wasn't added until the um, 70s, when uh, apparently Minsky uh, came across the Koleski profit equation. And he put that into his uh, financial instability hypothesis, where the idea is investment today is forthcoming only if investment is expected in the future. Okay, why does he put it this way? Because if there's no investment in the future, there's no profits in the future. Investment spending is the source of profits. It creates profits via the Koleski equation. And then finally, the financial instability hypothesis is the idea that apparent stability changes expectations and behavior in a way that generates fragility. Um, so there is an investment profit uh, positive feedback effect, uh, self-fulfilling expectations that actually make things worse uh, for reasons that I'll get to. So that's a, a summary of uh, what he's trying to do, and I'll go into his uh, model of uh, this and, and how he explains the, the development of the uh, financial profiles as we go through the business cycle. So investment theory of the cycle, financial theory of investment, at least a portion of investment has to be financed. Some of it is internal financed, but some of it is external financed. Um, so here is his famous investment diagram. 
Uh, on the vertical axis, we have the demand for capital, which is PK, and the supply of capital, which is PS. On the horizontal, we have the quantity of investment. And we can think of this as uh, both a diagram for the individual investment decision and also a diagram of what's going on in the economy as a whole. So a macro level uh, diagram. So <clears throat> in order for investment to occur, demand price has to be above the supply price. The supply price comes out of the current output price system. This is the, uh, the price quote that the supplier will give you if you buy a new machine, okay? And so say that this is the quote, we will sell you the machine for this price. Now you have to decide, is it worth it to buy it? Well, now you have to do the Keynes calculation. What are the expected returns from investing? And I need to discount those back to the present because the returns come in the future. And I can also add a, another discount factor for how uncertain am I about this? How much confidence do I have uh, in form formulating my expectations? So that discounted future returns give me a demand price, which is PK. Now I've drawn it so the PK is above the PS. Otherwise you don't invest, right? PK must be higher than PS or there's no investment. So we've got the demand price above. That means we want to invest. Okay. Could it the be I, that it's PK is ever equal to VPS? Like on the die, they start at the same place where the amount you want to, you're willing to pay is equal to the amount they're willing to supply. Well, uh, if it was exactly on it, I suppose you, you would invest up to this point. Okay. Right. All the interesting points are beyond this one though. <laughs> Okay, so I sub little i, I think it is very small to read. This is internal investment. So you're using your own retained funds. So you can invest this amount using your own funds. All right, but you can see the PK is way above the PS, so you're willing to borrow. If you borrow, then there's borrower's risk and lender's risk. Let's do the lender's risk first. So the lender's risk is mostly objective because it's written into the loan contract. So this is what it costs you to borrow. And as you borrow more, the costs go up. The, the costs include the interest rates and other um, codicils they put into the loan contract. It could be that you have to maintain bigger counterbalances in your deposit account. So banks will typically require you to have deposits in your account. So you have to hold more deposits. That's a cost to you. Um, and uh, the whatever else there, you know, the collateral that you have to have, uh, coming up with more collateral is a cost. So this slopes upward. That's lender's risk. For the most part, it's subjective. You know what it is because it's written into the contracts. There's also borrower's risk. Borrower's risk is subjective, okay? It's not written into a contract. It is how much risk do you think you're taking by going into debt? Because if you go into debt, uh, there's a danger you're gonna lose your firm um, if you can't service the debt. So you're taken to bankruptcy court. If you use your own funds, what if it turns out you were completely wrong uh, about the returns and your returns actually are down here? You lose your own funds, but you don't go bankrupt. But if it turns out the returns are down here and you borrowed, you lose your firm. So you have to build in a lender's risk that uh, is much, sorry, a borrower's risk that is much greater than um, just losing your own funds because you lose control over the firm. And this is also downward sloping because the, the more you borrow, the greater the risk you're gonna go bankrupt. 
The intersection of these two then determines how much you invest. This much you use your own funds, this much you borrow. Now, the uh, idea is that over the course of the cycle, these, these curves can shift around. And if it turns out that this was a, a, a good project, your expectations are met, you had built in a margin of error because you had accounted for borrower's risk. But you say, well, everything turned out fine. You might now think that the risks are lower. And so <clears throat> the borrower's risk curve could shift out more because you think the chances of bankruptcy aren't that great because the economy is doing really well, you're doing well, and you uh, reduce your estimate of what the borrower's risk is. So this curve could be flatter. At the same time, the lenders find out that, hey, you made all of your payments. The economy's doing well, hardly anyone's defaulting. So the lender's risk also is reduced. So in an expansion, these curves tend to get flatter and you get more and more investment. The more investment there is, the more profits there are. So the easier it is for you to get profits because there's more profits in the aggregate. So success breeds more success because it encourages more investment, which creates more profit, which then encourages you to borrow and invest more. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy until something goes wrong. When something goes wrong, then everything moves the other direction. Okay, a few big firms fail. They default on their debt. Now the banks start worrying. They increase the lender's risk. And borrowers start worrying it might ha happen to them too. So then all the curves shift in. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy too, because if investment is going down, profits go down and you're going to get more failures. So you can see how you could explain uh, the boom and you know the downturn because of the self-fulfilling nature of expectations. Investment leads to more profit. Reducing investment leads to less profit. So your expectations um, are reinforced by the way things work at the aggregate level. What so this is the model. What specific factor would flatten the curve compared to like just shifting it? Okay, well, the <clears throat> that's right. If If you become less optimistic, the PK is going to shift down and the borrower's risk is going to become steeper too. So both things probably happen. Right. When you're optimistic, probably both things happen too. Both the PK shifts up and the borrower's risk gets flatter and ditto for the lenders. Now, the PS is just going to depend on the costs uh, to the suppliers. So that one may not shift up and down over the course of the cycle. It might. It depends on whether you get bottlenecks in production. If you did, then the PS could shift up. It becomes more costly to produce the machines because you run up against a shortage of labor or a shortage of inputs. So it could shift up, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, would it be, because it seems to imply that the people who produce the machines are also the lenders, but usually you have a separate industrial sector, a banking sector, and then the borrowers. Yes. Um, so why would there be lenders risk for the producers themselves? Oh, no. The, this, this lender's risk is paid by you, the buyer, not by them. You, you have to pay interest uh, on um, the, uh, the loans from the banks. So lender's risk is faced by you, the buyer, not the yeah. seller. Okay. Although they may be borrowing too. <laughs> <laughs> so their interest rate could change. The final thing is, of course, what does the central bank do in an expansion? Eventually, they always raise interest rates. 
right? Yeah. So that that is going to increase the cost to you of borrowing. So interest costs are going to go up. This this curve can get steeper, not necessarily because the lenders are worried, but because the Fed is raising rates, the central bank is raising rates. So the uh, borrowing costs go up. Right. Okay. Endogenous money. Uh, Minsky's second phrase that is very famous is, anyone can create money, the problem is to get it accepted. So what he meant was, anybody can issue a monetary IOU. Your problem is to find someone to accept it. For banks, this is pretty easy because they have the central bank and the uh, deposit insurance, which in the U.S. is the treasury. Uh, they have the central bank and deposit insurance standing behind them. So it's easy for banks to get their money accepted. It's harder for the rest of us to get our money IOUs accepted. So would it have been harder for some banks to get their currency accepted in the free banking era? Sure. <laughs> yeah, banks' notes did not exchange at par in the U.S. So a, a Chase Bank uh, note that says a dollar on it might be accepted at 50 cents at uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, so, no, we did not have um, notes exchanging at par. So it would depend, you know, on the perceived riskiness of that bank. It could also just depend on um, how far away is the bank, right? Mm -hmm. The United States is a huge country. If you have a, a New York bank uh, note in San Francisco, uh, it may not be accepted at par even if no one's that worried about the bank okay um money uh is a unit of account um and then we have ious denominated in money so this is what he means when he says anyone can create money uh he, he's not he doesn't mean anyone can create currency of course that's not true but anyone can create a dollar denominated uh, IOU. Banks are firms just like other firms. They're uh, profit seekers and they are innovators. And they are continually innovating uh, for two reasons. One is the regulators that include the central bank and treasury uh, may be trying to constrain them. And so they innovate to get around constraints. And the second reason they innovate is because they're, they're uh, uh, competing for profits. And one of the ways you get profits is you come up with some new financial instrument. And you can uh, get profits from it for a while. The thing about uh, financial innovations is that you usually can't uh, trademark them right? Uh, so they get copied. So you, you invent securitized mortgages. And for a while, it's very profitable. But eventually, everyone's going to be doing it. And so the profits get competed away. So you have to innovate again. So you say, I'll securitize subprime mortgages, uh, because nobody's doing that yet. And then pretty soon, everybody's doing it. So you, you have to continually innovate with new products. Uh, or um, the, you know, the profits disappear because everybody can copy you. Um, the central bank is, uh, supervises, uh, banks, so looks at their balance sheets, uh, to see what they're doing. They regulate what is acceptable behavior and they set the interest rate target. Uh, they don't control the money supply. The, um, Minsky always said the most Im important function of the central bank is lender of last resort. Uh, and what that does is it sets a floor to asset prices. You can see the supervision and regulation as trying to set a ceiling to asset prices. So, for example, the, the Fed has the, the legal ability uh, to set margin requirements for stocks. So 
uh, how much can you borrow versus how much of your own funds do you have to use to play in the stock market? If stock market is booming, the Fed can raise margin requirements. That is to put a ceiling on financial assets. Or it can limit what banks can lend to, which kind of activities that they can lend to. That'll put a ceiling. The, the Fed also has the ability to regulate mortgage markets. So we can try to prevent a housing bubble by preventing lending. So the central bank sets both ceilings and floors. Lender of last resort, you're setting a floor because, you know, as Draghi says, whatever it takes. Once you say, we will buy it, you set a floor to how low it can go. Um, so what this approach, I mean, this sort of vision of how banks work, does that apply to like credit unions as well and building societies and whatnot? Yep, they're all they're all in you know a very similar um, activity, which is determining uh, what is uh, credit worthy enough for them to buy it. So, is your IOU credit worthy enough for me to buy it? Uh, credit unions, um, maybe they're buying commercial paper. So, you know, is the commercial paper of General Motors? uh credit worthy enough for us to buy yeah and then they issue their own liabilities so what financial institutions do that's unusual is they buy assets and issue liabilities you know so was this firm here they're buying assets and issuing liabilities but the difference is financial institutions put very little of their own money in right? 5% to 8%. The, their leverage ratio is very high. Their leverage ratio might be 20 to 1 for a bank. It might be 300 to 1 for a, uh, uh, a non-bank bank, a shadow bank, maybe 300 to 1. So the leverage ratios are very, very high, much higher than for non-financial corporations. So it's mostly other people's money uh, that they are using. In other words, they're issuing liabilities that people are holding to finance their position in assets. And the ratio of um, their uh, financial liabilities to their financial assets is very high, much higher than for non-financial corporations. But otherwise, everybody's issuing liabilities to buy assets. But what makes financial institutions different is the percent of their own money that's at risk. It's very low. That's why they have to be regulated. Uh, Isn't another important fact of whether they're backstop by the central bank, such as a financial institution, <clears throat> but doesn't have an account at the central bank and they're creating loans, then obviously that kind of is a risk to, to prices. Yes, it is. And that, see, that's the, that's why the, the regulation should be much closer on a chartered bank because the, um, uh, the equity uh, is not so much at risk because the central bank is going to step in and help them. And so market incentives don't work at all <laughs> with a, a chartered bank that has the treasury and central bank standing behind them. They, they can't work uh, because they, they have protection behind them. If you talk about um, shadow banks, then the idea is that uh, the holders of liabilities know uh, that there's a risk and they are supposed to do some kind of supervision. Now, the reality is that doesn't work either. Uh, because uh, you, let's say it's not transparent. It's too difficult to find out what they're holding, which is what we found out with crypto, right? <laughs> it was too difficult to uh, find out, uh, you know, what the assets really were of these exchanges. 
And it turned out they didn't have much of any. They had, all they had was liabilities, almost no assets. Okay, final step. The financial instability hypothesis. So it's a financial theory of investment, investment theory of the cycle. <clears throat> Positions and assets have to be financed, including investment. Uh, you build in margins of safety in case your expectations were too optimistic. So Minsky uh, developed this classification scheme. There are hedge, speculative, and Ponzi financial profiles. A hedge profile is one where the expectation is that your income flowing in is enough to service your debt, to pay both principal and interest. That's the safest one. A speculative position is one where in short term, you can cover the interest payments, but not the principal. Okay, this is okay, as long as your income will go up. So lots of kinds of investments. Uh, you don't get much uh, income in the near term, but eventually your income flow will go up. That's why you're investing. So a lot of investments are speculative. This is not speculative in the same sense as of Keynes. This is not a euphoric speculative, speculative bubble. This is just a speculative profile where your income needs to go up in order to pay the principal. And then finally, Ponzi is when you can't even pay the interest. So you have to capitalize the interest. That is, you have to borrow to pay interest. There are some kinds of businesses where Ponzi finance is okay. Like if you're a home builder, you're building a home, you're going to sell it. You have no income until you sell the home. Uh, that's a Ponzi finance because you still have to pay the interest, but you pay the interest by capitalizing it into your loan. So your loan gets bigger and bigger until finally you can sell the home. Uh, so Ponzi uh, could be a strategy that's okay. But what Minsky's more worried about is you become Ponzi because your income fell. So if you were in a speculative position, you could pay the interest, but then instead of going up, your income goes down you can't pay the interest. Now you're Ponzi. So you have to start borrowing to pay interest. So Ponzi is the riskiest one. And things uh, either have to get better or you're gonna get cut off because a bank will not continue to lend to you, increasing the size of your loan uh, forever. So, Ponzi is unsustainable financial position. Uh, it can't continue. His argument is that over the course of the cycle, you start out from uh, you know, the depression or a deep recession with a robust financial system because uh, everybody who had risky financial positions went bankrupt. So we have a robust financial system but over time, success will create instability. So you will get, uh, you will move from mostly hedge to a mixture of hedge and speculative, and then finally to a sp speculative position dominate the economy, and you get some Ponzi. And then either banks cut off the lending or some Ponzi units fail. And then that can spread through the system as the lenders tighten up all the lending standards. And um, it gets hard to, uh, to get loans. Investment falls, profits fall, and the system goes into a downturn. So that's the, um, uh, the explanation of the business cycle. You can even get a Fisher debt deflation process. So this is Fisher, 1933, when he wrote about the Great Depression, uh, was so bad, uh, not just because output fell and unemployment rose, but because asset prices collapsed, because everybody had to sell assets to try to make payments on their own debts. 
And that is what causes all the asset prices to collapse because if they're there's all sellers and no buyers, the prices fall. So in the Great Depression, asset prices fell by 85% in the United States. GDP only fell by 50%. So uh, that is what made the Depression so bad. <clears throat> Institutional constraints put ceilings and floors on income. So that is the big government. That's the fiscal policy. Put ceilings and floors on income. Uh, Minsky talks about the income and employment effect. That's basically the multiplier. So government spending has a multiplier attached to it. Uh, if government increases its spending, that has a multiplier impact on total spending. There's also a cash flow effect. That is the Kolesky profit equation. That government deficits increase profits. So when you go into a downturn, the deficit goes up. That keeps profits flowing to firms so they can make payments on their debt. And then finally, the portfolio effect of big government is that deficits lead to government debt, which is a safe asset to hold in portfolios. So you get um, uh, government debt into private portfolios and uh, strengthen the portfolios. The uh, big bank is the central bank. It also puts ceiling and floors. I talked more about them already. Supervision, regulation, lender of last resort. The problem with having a big government and big bank is it creates a moral hazard because the government is there to uh, bail the system out and they especially bail out the biggest firms and biggest banks because that fa their failure would have the uh, too big of an effect on the economy. And then that creates uh, the expectation that the government will always come to the rescue. So no risk is too great. And you get um, uh, the transition from hedge to speculative to Ponzi. In the, Minsky's latest work, he talked about the long-term evolution of the economy you know, over the whole post-war period from a very uh, stable kind of capitalism that he called money, uh, sorry, not money, managerial welfare state capitalism that um, had the big government and the big central bank institutions that promoted stability um, and uh, institutions that help to keep uh, employment closer to full employment. But gradually over time, that was transformed into money manager capitalism uh, in the 1980s, which was a much riskier kind of capitalism in which the main financial institutions were not regulated banks. They were what we used to call non-bank banks, but Paul McCulley came up with the term shadow banks. Those become the dominant financial institutions. They're much riskier. They're not regulated very much. Um, and they are not transparent. It's hard to know what's going on. And that is what finally collapsed in the global financial crisis. Money manager capitalism is very similar to what we had before the Great Depression, which was called finance capitalism by Hilferding. Minsky argued that kind of capitalism crashed in 1929. We replaced it with this very stable kind of capitalism, but that gradually evolved to money manager capitalism. And uh, he asked the question, can it happen again? What he meant was, Great Depression with a Fisher debt deflation process. He asked that question in 1984 and he said, no, it can't. The reason is because we have all these stabilizing institutions. By 1989, he changed his mind. He said, yes, it possibly could happen again. And we came close <laughs> in 2008, <laughs> okay? And we may come close again. So uh, it didn't quite happen again. We got the worst uh, global financial crisis since the 1930s, uh, but we did recover. 
And we still are in this stage, money manager capitalism. Right. Okay, what to do? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I, mean, I have one more yeah. slide. So I think Minsky agreed that the central bank has to step in as a lender of last resort. Um, but many people, both left on the road, especially of the left, they, they see this as, as a bailout and that the too big to fail banks should have been mm -hmm. left to fail and die. So what really was the bailout in 2008? Yeah. Was it bad? Well, yeah. Well, lender of last resort really does not mean you bail out the bank. It means you bail out the bank's customers. Okay. Um, now, M Minsky died in 1996, well before the crisis. So there's no way to know for sure what he would have done in 2008. Okay. Uh, I think the Fed should have been a lender of last resort. I think the FDIC should have paid off insured depositors, but I think that uh, we should have done what FDR did in 1933. And I believe Minsky would agree with this. The only way I, I can justify saying that Minsky would agree is because he wrote a lot about what FDR did. Okay, so I think he would have said, we should do what FDR did, which is you, you declare a bank holiday, you shut down all the big banks. See, in the United States, our small banks were fine. They didn't do any of the crazy stuff. So we had thousands of small banks that were perfectly fine. We would have only had to close uh, 12 banks. Close those 12 banks down uh, and uh, take them over, fire all the management and start prosecuting them and put as many of them in prison as we could. And we, we could have probably put a thousand of them in prison, prosecute every single one of them, very long prison terms to teach them a lesson. Um, and then, which we did in the saving and loan crisis, we put a thousand uh, top management in prison. Um, then gradually sell off the assets, cover the insured depositors, and then choose which other kinds of holders of liabilities uh, there would be a public uh, purpose in saving. So for example, pension funds. Uh, pension funds were holding a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage assets that uh, were sold to them by the investment banks. And I think we should have bailed out the pension funds. So we would have to make choices like that that aren't easy choices. You know, who do you save? Who do you let fail? Um, but that's what we should have done. And I think Minsky would agree. None of that is lender of last resort. Lender of last resort means that you lend to a bank that is healthy and has good assets that in normal times uh, would be acceptable collateral for lending. And you lend at a penalty interest rate. We didn't do any of those things. <laughs> so the, what, what Bernanke did uh, was completely inconsistent with lender of last resort. Okay. Uh, a lender of last resort. Penalty interest. I know Warren Mosler doesn't agree with penalty interest rates because yeah. his, his idea is that you give the reserves so people can... Um, some people's deposit to save, but like, what what's the rationale behind penalty interest rates? Because you don't want them to come unless they really need it. And we did the opposite. See, we didn't even make them come to the discount window. What Bernanke did was he auctioned off reserves, and then uh, the, the 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 final accepted bid, whatever that rate was, which would be the lowest one. So the, the Fed would take the highest bids first. And if they're auctioning off, say, 800 billion of uh, reserves, uh, the final bid for that last dollar of the 800 billion, whatever that interest rate was, was the interest rate everybody paid. So it not only wasn't a penalty rate, it wasn't even the market rate. It was below the market rate. 
That's what the Fed was lending at. It's the opposite. The opposite of well-established lender of last resort policy. So we weren't even lending at the market rate. Okay. So we were subsidizing the interest rate lending uh, basically to 14 banks, 14 global banks got most of the loans. And um, it, it much of what the Fed did was illegal, illegal by Federal Reserve Act rules. Not only bad idea, but illegal activities uh, that the Fed was engaged in. And remember, uh, Bernanke knew this. Congress asked him, we want the data. We want to know what you guys did. And Bernanke refused to supply it. Bloomberg took um, the Fed to court under a Freedom of Information Act uh, case and won. And so that data was released. And two of my graduate students went through the data and found out there's $29 trillion of uh, loans originated uh, the vast majority of that for 14 banks uh, plus foreign central banks. That's who uh, got the um, lending and it's 29 trillion. We shouldn't have done any of that. Okay. Uh, I think Warren and I strongly disagree with each other on what should have been done. Uh, I, I think that those, those banks had engaged in massively fraudulent behavior and they should have been shut down and prosecuted, not saved. And the financial system would be much better today if we had done that. Uh, because... Both the, the lender of last resort isn't the saving per se, it was more the subsidized interest rates. Um, um, and, and, what, do you think by... the what do you think is the main component of the bailout? Subsidized interest rates for a period of two years in which the banks could not borrow in markets because nobody trusted them. Um, so they got subsidized interest rates uh, day after day. Most of these, the, the loans are short term. And so they have to renew them the next day because they still can't borrow in markets. Um, buying massive quantities of assets. Uh, I'm not talking about QE because then they also... Uh, bought lots of assets in QE, but th this was the the alphabet soup of special programs the Fed was engaged in. We don't know exactly uh, what those assets were. The um, uh, the two students who totaled up all of the um, lending uh, also were uh, going to continue the project to look at what the Fed bought. The Fed claimed it didn't buy um, uh, trashy mortgage-backed securities. We don't know for sure whether they did or not. Um, they claim that they didn't, but uh, it's likely that they did. The question is whether the Fed only bought government insured mortgage backed securities. So if, if all the mortgages in the securities were government backed, the government was already on the hook. So you, you could argue that, um, you know, the, we, we would have ended up with them anyway. <laughs> the treasury would have had them if they were bad mortgages. Um, but we don't know for sure if that's true. And to my knowledge, nobody has gone through the data to see whether it's true or not. And in regards to QE, I mean, there's a misperception that's just giving banks free money. But there is the argument that they bought the assets at above market prices, like far above. Is that true? Uh, it's possible that, again, you would have to go really through the assets to see what they were buying. And I don't know the answer to that. But definitely, if the Fed is, is there uh, buying, they will tend to push those prices up. But it's true that the Fed wasn't just giving them money. Uh, they were buying assets and crediting reserves. And it's not even clear that this was uh, to the advantage of banks. 
because on the um, uh, securities, they were earning interest. The, the Fed bought a lot of treasury securities too. And uh, the banks are um, substituting uh, very low interest earning reserves for higher interest earning securities. It, it wasn't clear that this was good for banks. Yeah, well, we're running out of time, so I just want to really speed through the next, the last stuff. So is there okay, this, left? this is it. All right. Which is, um, you know, what do we do? Uh, we're in this era of money manager capitalism, which is a highly unstable kind of capitalism. And the uh, the, the question is, what do you do? Well, to, to some extent, the evolution of the financial system is inevitable. You can't stop it. Stability is destabilizing. So if you achieve stability, uh, you're going to evolve toward instability. <laughs> this is a natural process. And uh, Minsky liked one thing about rational expectations was that the agents in the model have a model of the model, okay? He, he thought that, that that was a good innovation of Lucas and the new classicals. Um, the problem was that the agents in a, a Lucas model uh, have a model of the model and their model is the correct model. It's the way the world really works, right? Uh, Minsky argued that those agents are, are crazy. They're insane. <laughs> the, the only people who think that they know how the world works are insane people, the ones that stand on the street corner, right? Um, jabbering, uh, because everyone else knows that their model is wrong. But their model um, will uh, influence their behavior and their model will, will be continually changing through time. And as the, their model of how the world works changes, uh, their behavior changes. Just as a, an example, so the early post-war period was very stable. And so your model of the way the world works gradually moves uh, to the belief that the world is stable. There, when you first come out of the Great Depression, uh, your model includes the Great Depression. But after 20 years of no great depressions, your model has changed. You say, oh, well, that was the past. We don't do that anymore. We don't have great depressions anymore. And so now you don't have a great depression in your model of the way the world works. And this is why we transition to a very fragile economy, because you discount the possibility that things could go bad. And then, of course, it becomes self-fulfilling, because you take too many risks until you start getting financial crises. So he used to say that his financial instability hypothesis is ultimately pessimistic because there's nothing you can do. If you put in place institutions to make the economy stable, you will make the economy unstable. All right. Um, so we had 1930s reforms. The problem is all those innovations uh, made the reforms um, uh, completely impotent. So the reforms don't work anymore. And they're not. it's not a matter of just going back and saying, well, let's do what Roosevelt did. Let's separate commercial banks from investment banks and uh, you know, regulate the interest rate the banks can pay like we did in the 1930s. Those reforms won't work anymore. So we need new kinds of reforms that are appropriate to the money manager capitalism stage. Free markets ideology is not going to work. We need new policies to reduce insecurity, promote stability, and encourage uh, democracy. And these were three uh, very important um, things on Minsky's agenda throughout all of his writing. Uh, reducing insecurity such as unemployment, uh, old age insecurity, 
um, reduce that kind of ins insecurity, promote stability in the financial sector, and encourage democracy, uh, both political and economic democracy. Those are the three things that he wanted uh, policy to do. And when he came to the Levy Institute in 1990, uh, that whole period, six years from 1990 to 1996, Minsky is writing a series of papers on how capitalism had changed and um, uh, what kinds of new policies we needed in order to, to deal with that. So I will stop with that. Thank you. I had hoped to want to go into the types of regulation and policies into detail, but we won't have time. I think I might just run through like two or three, just briefly to hear your opinion on them. Um, I think uh, Glass-Steagall was probably the one regulation everyone knows about that they thought was critical in, in leading to the financial crisis. What, what's your opinion on Glass-Steagall and how much it actually contributed to stability? Yeah. Um, Minsky <clears throat> was um, less enthusiastic. Uh, he did write on that. So you can see his Levy papers. He uh, tended to favor the bank holding company model. So you have Bank of America as a holding company. It has a, a commercial bank. It has an investment bank. It has Merrill Lynch today and so on. It may be an insurance company. Um, but if you do that, uh, you have to have, you know, Chinese walls between them uh, so that you can protect the commercial banking part. And um, uh, I think that, that that was his preference. But he also wanted to promote small banks, not big banks, small to medium-sized banks. So Minsky was against having these $3 trillion banks. Uh, he probably would uh, agree with breaking them up. Um, so we could have big, uh, we could have bank holding companies. So you have a variety of kinds of business, but uh, they would be smaller banks in there. And we had a proposal for community development banks, which are very small banks that um, would be uh, focused on local communities. He wanted to promote that, but that he was always against bigness, bigness of banks and also bigness of non-financial corporations, because he didn't think that was consistent with his last thing here, democracy. Bigness is not consistent with democracy. So break them up. Um, Personally, I, I'm probably more of a fan of um, Glass-Steagall, of um, preventing um, commercial banks from getting involved in other things. And the main reason is because um, they, the at least the bigger ones, will they're always incentivized to dupe their customers. So if I walk into a Bank of America today, there, there, there's a, a little cubicle of Merrill Lynch. And they, they're, they're, they're trying to grab you and bring you into their little cubicle and sell you some investment products. Um, and uh, I'm not saying they've never done anything illegal with me, you know, but the temptation is always there. You take this little old grandma who doesn't know what she's buying and she thinks she's in Bank of America and therefore she's got deposit insurance and you try to sell her something that's not insured. I'm worried about that. Um, so I, I like to separate them. Uh, one policy about stocks, um, stock buybacks. I mean, a lot of people defend them because they say if there's not an investment opportunity around, whether it's because of aggregate demand or whatnot, then you know, let them use that surplus cash to, to invest in their own stocks. Um, what do you say to that? They absolutely should not be allowed to buy their own stocks. They, I think it's absolutely crazy that we let them do that because the incentives are all wrong. If you tell a CEO that um, we're, we're going to give you stock options and your mission is to maximize share prices, what are they going to do? <laughs> They're going to do stock buybacks. It's the, the quickest way to increase their own stock option value and increase uh, share value. 
No, if if they can't think of anything better to do, pay the workers more. Increase wages. Okay, if there's no profitable investments out there, pay the workers. You don't need the profit. Okay. At least they don't drive them out of business of all the wage costs and whatnot. No, no, look, they're making all this profit. Okay, they've got plenty of retained earnings. That tells me they're making far more profit than they need to. Because, you know, why do you want profit? Well, one reason you want profit is to have retained earnings so you can invest. But then they're telling me, no, we don't want to invest. We don't see any good investment opportunities. Then pay the workers more. And you can pay the shareholders too, increase the dividends. So they have two good options there. Okay, one is pay the workers a decent wage and the other is dividends. So no, I don't buy it at, at all because the incentives are all wrong. Uh, one, one question on behalf of my former economics teacher. He was, he was very um, gold standard kind of, kind of guy. He said uh, QE is terrible because banks will use all that money to invest in the stock market. <laughs> what do you say to that? They... Look, QE puts excess reserves into banks. There is nothing they can do with excess reserves. It can't go anywhere. The only thing they can do is lend it to another bank, but banks don't want it. Okay. The, the reserves never leave the balance sheet of the central bank. There is nothing a bank can do with reserves. I mean, they, they could try to create a run on the bank. That's the only way the reserves can get out. Yeah. Okay, if they say, oh, we're... We're on the verge of failure. You better come get your deposits. That's the only way to get reserves out of the system. Otherwise, the reserves stay in the banking system. Yeah. So this sounds like somebody who doesn't understand a, a T account. Yeah, it's quite a mis big misunderstanding that reserves can just be spent like, like any money can. Um, and the last and final question, why not public banks? Why don't we just nationalize the banking oh, system? Yeah, I, I I don't have anything against public banks. I think it's a good idea. The community development banks that I was talking about, these were sort of public-private partnerships with the federal government being a part owner uh, I, and uh, development banks, which are common uh, around the world. Uh, we sort of have it too in the United States. So we, we have the federal government involved in lending. Uh, we have student loans where the federal government is involved in lending. Is there any examples of countries that have like a full public banking system and, and it works? I, I don't know about full, but there are hundreds of uh, development banks around the world um, that, you know, finance the development of the economy. Um, and then... Um, there are uh, well, I there are public banks, I'm sure. But I think that's the public... that's the answer to Minsky's pessimism. That well, it's not the answer. Could it uh, increase stability of the financial system? Yeah, it uh, could, um, and it could also promote economic development which Minsky also was trying to do, even for the United States. We're an underdeveloped country in many, many ways. Uh, it would help us to develop too. So I, I support public banks. Um, do I want to completely eliminate private banking? No, not necessarily. So I'm not seeing them as a, an alternative to private banks, but a supplement to private banks. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. This was really educational and I really appreciate you coming on. It was, it was fantastic. Okay. Well, for those who want more on Minsky, this is a 2015 book. And this on the left is my latest book on money. And there will be another one in uh, March that is a, um, a cartoon book on money. Right. Okay. Could I, Giovanni, could you get the textbook? I can advertise that because it's yeah. key. Thank you.
And I would recommend to everybody uh, to have a look at the textbook that Randall Ray and Bill Mitchell and Martin Watts wrote 2019, I believe. It, it's absolutely brilliant. It's a good uh, post-Keynesian introduction into uh, economics uh, as opposed to the neoclassical books that you're familiar with. Um, this is far better. And uh, on that note, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.